So our first reading today is from 1 Kings chapter 19, um, and we'll be reading verse 1 to 8. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and, that, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, where, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, is, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked in hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he rose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Can I uh, invite you, uh, for our final Bible reading, can I invite you to Hebrews chapter 2 again. This is where we were uh, last week, uh, as I had mentioned uh, this is our uh, final week in a uh, different portion. Next week, we commence our series in the Gospel of Luke, and we could be there uh, for a little while. Uh, but our Bible reading, we're going to read uh, Hebrews uh, uh, verse 17 uh, to 18. I'm just going to, uh, I don't have it uh, on the screen, but I'm just going to read uh, the few verses before it as well. I'm going to read from verse 14 just to remind us where we were um, last week. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, and we'll read to verse 18. It says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Well, this morning, no, no matter uh, who you are in this room, every single one of us, without exception, every single one of us is subject to temptation, hardships, and suffering. Now, Jesus gave us a parable you may remember in Matthew 7 of two houses. Now, these two houses had uh, a number of uh, things that were different between them. You'd remember they were built on different foundations. One of them was built on the sand. One of them was built on the rock. And there were more differences. They shared a different fate. One of them crashed under the weight of the elements and the other one that was built on the rock stood firm, yet they did have one thing in common. Despite all of their difference, they had one thing in common. Both of them were subject to the winds, and both of them were subject to the heavy rain. They shared that in common. And so Jesus, when he talks about that, the winds and the rains that beat on the houses, is he not referring to temptations, trials, suffering, and hardships? No one, both houses are subject to that. So no matter who you are, you will face these things, especially, especially if you're a Christian. 
Let me quote Spurgeon. He said, All the heirs of heaven pass under this yoke. All true gold must feel the fire. All wheat must be threshed. All diamonds must be cut. All Christians must endure temptation. End quote. So if this is true, this sad reality is true, where shall we find comfort if this is our lot in life? Where is there to be comfort found? Well, the comfort is Jesus himself has been there. And he was subject to these things that we must face. Trials, temptations, hardship, and suffering. And so the passage that we have before us, verses 17 to 18, is great help. It's comfort. It's strength. It's support for us who are so often tempted and who face suffering. So before we jump in, let's pray and ask that God would really bless this wonderful passage to our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we we find it is always relevant and it is always timely. And this morning we have such a precious passage that your spirit has given to us in these pages. We pray that your spirit would open our eyes, cause us to see, and we pray that we may be greatly helped. You have said the storm, the winds, and the rain will come upon us. Now, Lord, help us, we pray. Take your word and plant it deep into our hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, just the the context here as we consider these verses. Remember, these Christians, these are Jewish Christians that are being written to here, and they are being tempted, and they're being tempted through suffering. Now, having embraced the Messiah that the nation of Israel had rejected, these Jewish Christians had now been considered enemies of the state. They're traitors. Traitors to Israel. And now, as we read, as you read on throughout Hebrews, especially as you get into chapter 10, we see that they were now facing imprisonment from their fellow Jews. They had their property confiscated. And we see that they were deprived of social privileges like work opportunities. They were marginalized and cast out. But the ultimate temptation through all of these pressures, the ultimate temptation was to apostatize from Jesus Christ. To turn away and go back to Judaism. And then everything will go back to normal. The temptations and the suffering will ease. So that's the context. And the writer of this, of this letter, he is writing to these Christians who are being tempted this way. Well, this morning, if you are taking notes, our first point as we consider Jesus Christ in these passages, we see him, a brother made like us. A brother made like us. Look at verse 17, just the beginning. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Now, I want to be uh, quite brief on this point here because we considered it a bit last week. But he had to be made like his brothers. See, by implication of his incarnation and taking on flesh, we become now as God's people, Jesus' brothers. And he becomes our brother. That's what the passage says repeatedly. Look at verse 11, the last line of verse 11. That's why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. And verse 14, which we saw last week, Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. He became like us. He became a brother to us, having taken on flesh. Now, why did he need to be fully human? We considered last week. He had to taste death for us. And to taste death, he had to become a man. But he had to die so that he could pay for our sin to destroy the one who has the power over death, we saw that is the devil, and to free us from the fear of death. That's what we saw last week. But I want to ask the question, was the only reason he took on flesh, the only reason he became a man, was the only reason him dying? Is it? If so, if he just came to die, he could have died a lot younger than 33. Couldn't he? 
If he came just to die, he could have lived a secluded life through most of his years. He could have retreated. He could have laid low. He could have gone to be by himself like the monks and the nuns do and to stay away from this world. If he simply came just to die, then the years between his birth and his execution were inconsequential, right? Because he only came to die. But him living as a man was just as necessary for him to die as a man. Living as a man was just as necessary as dying as a man. And this is the author's argument in these two verses here. Verse 17, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Made like us in every respect. It is very important for us to regularly contemplate the full humanity of Jesus. That is a very healthy thing for us to do as Christians. In what ways was he like us? What ways was he like us? You know, the New, Test- the New Testament accounts are so rich with details concerning this. I've just listed a number of them here. Let me walk through them. What do we see in the New Testament? He needed to learn to grow in wisdom and stature. He needed to grow in physical and mental strength. He knew hunger and he felt the pinch of thirst. He knew what it was to be without comforts. Remember Matthew 8.20, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He was an itinerant preacher. He needed to submit to authorities. He experienced astonishment and surprise. He marveled at the rank unbelief of some and the remarkable faith of others, didn't he? He knew joy, but he also felt indignation and anger. He was zealous and passionate. He felt troubled and grieved at things that he saw. He suffered injustice firsthand. He made friends and he made enemies. He daily carved out time to pray. He read the scriptures. He listened to the scriptures and he lived by the scriptures. He exercised faith in his heavenly father. He committed himself to death, believing that his father would raise him and not leave him in the grave. He felt the weight of mental and psychological agony. Our Lord Jesus experienced tiredness. Think about that infamous account of the boat in the storm. He's in the boat with the disciples and the storm is raging. The waters are in a frenzy. The disciples are beside themselves and they're panicking and they believe they're going to die. They're fighting for their lives. And where's Jesus? He's asleep in the stern. Now, why is he asleep? We must read the passage carefully. He's not asleep because he's trying to test them to see what they'll do if he's not watching. No, he's asleep. And the wind is beating. The waves are beating down. There's so much noise. The howling of the winds. The rushing of the waters. The screaming of the disciples. And Jesus is asleep through all of it. The perfect storm. I ask you, how exhausted must a man be to sleep through something like that? See, his life was one of constant laboring. On his feet, he felt exhaustion. What else? He'd been on the receiving end of good news and bad news. He went to weddings and he went to funerals. He knew the bleakness of sorrow. Isaiah 53, 3 says he is a man of sorrows. He shed tears when his heart was broken. His dear friend Lazarus died and he wept when he contemplated the fate of the Jews of his day. He knew what it was to reap, and he experienced loss. He experienced the sting of false accusation, and he felt the kiss of betrayal. He knew what it is to love and to give love. He washed his disciples' feet. He spent himself all day, every day for people. His life and ministry was a living sacrifice until the moment he gave his life as the ultimate sacrifice. He loved. See, this is 
the Jesus of the Scriptures. He had to be made like His brothers in every respect. This is the Jesus who lived on the earth, and this is the Jesus that the apostles preached when He ascended to heaven. Now, can you imagine what this kind of Jesus was like to the ears of the Jews when they heard Him preached? To them, God, so holy, so powerful, so powerful, so high and lifted up above this world. And you're saying that the almighty El Shaddai took on human frailty. The all-powerful one became weak. The one who is completely unlike us became one of us in every respect. No wonder the message of Christ was a stumbling block to the Jews. And what about to the Greeks and the Gentiles? What did they believe? They believed in a myriad of gods. And what were their gods like? These powerful deities who couldn't care less and who were apathetic to human suffering and misery. They needed to be bribed just to do something and send provisions to this world. And now you're telling me that the one true and living God, He became frail and weak like us. It was foolishness to the Gentiles. And yet here is the Son of God, Jesus. He had to be made like His brothers in every respect. Let me quote one writer. He said this, The writer of Hebrews is saying that we have a God, not only who is there, but one who has been there. See, our God isn't just there. He's been there. Where we are. He's a brother made like us. Second point. This morning, a brother who was also tempted. A brother who was also tempted. Look at verse 18. Because he himself has suffered when tempted. He suffered when tempted. When you read, go on a couple of chapters, Hebrews 4.15 says, He is one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. In every respect. Jesus faced temptations as we constantly do. Now before we consider this, we need to make two important clarifications. When we talk about the temptations that fell upon Christ. It says he was tempted in every respect as we are tempted. Now, Jesus lived in ancient Israel. He lived 2,000 years ago. Jesus, in his day, did not have around him digital pornography. He did not have smartphones and TVs that he could be addicted to. There were no credit cards that you could steal or guns that you could use to take revenge. Now when it says he was tempted in every respect as us, not that the actual instances and occasions were like what we face, but the essence of sin was still there. There's the temptation for sexual immoral behavior, temptations for revenge and violence, to be dishonest and deceive, to take revenge. Temptations for wealth, love of money, possessions, materialism, temptations of idolatry. These were all put before Jesus. Sin is always the same. A second qualification that we need to make is that one of the sources of temptation was different for Jesus than it was for us. Now, we are tempted by external attacks. We are tempted by the world. We are tempted by the devil. Jesus was too. External attacks. We are also tempted from internal desires. Internal desires within us. Our fallen nature, our sinful cravings. Jesus was not tempted from internal desires. We inherited a sinful nature from Adam and Eve. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, but conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He did not get Adam's sinful nature. He was not inclined to evil like us. All the temptations that fell upon him were from external forces. And yet, as we consider this, we must not minimize the severity of of the temptations that he faced. Again, the New Testament accounts are so rich with details concerning this. Let us go through some of them. We see him in the Scriptures face temptations from the world. In John 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000 miraculously, and the crowds are absolutely astonished. 
And they believe this must be the promised one from the Old Testament. What does it say? Verse 15. Jesus, knowing that they'd intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Matthew 21. Jesus comes to Jerusalem riding on a donkey and the people go nuts. They're grabbing branches and they're waving and they're praising. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, the son of David. Save us, they're saying. What's the temptation he faced? What a powerful temptation. You can ascend the throne and bypass the cross. We'll make you king. We'll make you king right now. What do we see with Jesus? A week later, he's hanging on the cross. We see him face temptations from his friends. From his friends. Matthew 16 and verses 15 to 16, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says, You are the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. In the next verses, Jesus explains to them, The Son of Man, I must go. I must be delivered over, I must be killed, and then raised from the dead. And Peter pulls him aside and says, May it never be. Peter rebuked him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. What's Peter saying? You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. You are not worthy to have to suffer that. You are too wonderful and excellent. Again, what's the temptation? The glory without the cross. The throne without Calvary. The crown without the thorns. His friends constantly put temptation before him. We see him tempted by his enemies. They tempted him to revenge. To revenge during his abusive trial. Remember Jesus on that wonderful, the most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. What did Jesus preach? Matthew 5.39 if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, offer to him the other one also. Do not resist an evil person, Jesus said. And what is a temptation that befalls him on his trial? Mark 14, 65, some begin to spit on him and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists and they said, prophesy who hit you and they slapped him in the face. What's a temptation? To not practice what he preached. Turn the other cheek. To seek his own revenge and to retaliate. And what does it say the Son of God? He did not open his mouth. Here's the other side. His enemies tempted him even while he was dying on the cross. If you are truly the Son of God, come down from the cross. Save yourself. He saved others. Let him save himself. Come on, show us if you're really him. What are they doing? They're provoking him. They're taunting and mocking him. This is the weak tempting the strong. They're insulting him to seek revenge. What strength it took for him to not send down the fires that he rained on Sodom and Gomorrah. He already said this generation is more guilty than Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet he hangs. He hangs. What else do we see? We see him face temptations from his family. From his family. His own brothers. His own kindred. His siblings. John 7, 2 to 5. Now the Jewish feast of booths was at hand. So Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. See, they wanted him to go more public. Bigger miracles and bigger crowds. Take over the world, Jesus. Why are they saying this? Not many were believing in Jesus and they didn't believe in him either. His brothers. And what's the temptation before him? He loved his siblings. He loved his brothers. And the temptation was to submit to their desires. To win them over through another strategy. To give them what they want. Why would this be sin? 
Because Jesus knew what his mission was. I only say and do what the Father tells me to do. It's my meat and my drink to do the Father's will. And he doesn't listen. Friends, how often are we tempted by family to please them before God? Constantly face. I hear from parents all the time. My kid's so good at sport, but now the competition is on Sundays. I want to give them every opportunity to succeed. And so three weeks out of the month, we play sport on Sunday morning. Christians knowing family members who aren't saved and family members organize family gatherings on Sunday morning. What do we want to do? We don't want to offend them. Even when Christ has called us together and worship his name together. We're always tempted by our family to please them before the Lord. But he did not yield. But Jesus understands. He understands. And yet it seems the fiercest of his temptations were from another source. Because the scriptures show us that he faced strong temptations from the devil. You know, Matthew 4, straight after his baptism, the Holy Spirit that just descended upon him says led him into the wilderness where he would be tested for 40 days. And in those 40 days, Jesus is fasting. He's fasting for 40 days. If your Bible had pictures in it, you would see a man who is unrecognizable. He is skin and bones. You do not recognize this man in the wilderness. He's incredibly weak, weaker than he's ever been. And then it says the devil comes along to skin and bones. And it says in Luke 4, the devil takes him up to Jerusalem to the pinnacle of the temple. The pinnacle. And, and the devil said to him, throw yourself down if you are the son of God. For Psalm 91 says that he will send his angels concerning you so that you don't strike your, fo- your foot against a stone. What's Satan doing? He's tempting Jesus to doubt God, to test God. We must understand this is one of Satan's most common temptations to the Christian to tempt us to doubt God when we are at our weakness, when we are suffering, when things are worse than ever in family, in relationships, in work, in our health, in everything. At our weakest, He puts into our minds what? Do you believe God loves you? Would He allow this to someone that He loves so much? Would He allow such sickness to one of His own children? Would He allow death to come to you? If, you, if you're his child, do you believe that silly book that's got all these promises for you? What good are its promises now? Where are they? You thought he was real, but he's not. What good has your faith been? Look where you are. He's causing us to, tempt, to be tempted to doubt God. What a liar! He is the father of lies. And friends, if he is so brazen to even tempt his maker, to tempt the Son of God, do you think he will deal gently with us? No, he won't. He will not. And so in those moments when the lies come into our minds, I mean, when we are suffering and we are tempted, understand the same lies were put into the Savior's mind and came through the same ears that he shared with us. He heard the same thing. He was buffeted by the same things. He was hard-pressed. Friends, Jesus knows. He knows. Jesus knows, so run to him. Run to him. He's our older brother. Well, the devil didn't stop there. He took Jesus up on a high mountain. And it says, he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. All the nations follow his evil rule. And he says to Jesus, all this I will give you. All of these kingdoms. See, the world hates God. The world loves darkness. They swim in sin as naturally as a fish does in water. They love it. They live there. And so he offers Jesus the masses who love evil. And he offers Jesus fame and success and praise and recognition. And what was the cost of temptation? This one here. The cost was idolatry. All these I will give to you. If you would just bend your knee, bow and worship me, and I'll give all of it to you. All of it, Christians, Jesus 
faced worldly temptation. He knows it was put before him. We face the love of money. We face the pull for success. We face the praise of men that is ungodly. Like us, the world was put before Jesus. Jesus withstood the devil's arrows. He did. But that was just in the wilderness. That wasn't the end. The devil didn't pack up there. It says at the end of that account in the wilderness, Luke 4.13, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. That wasn't the end of it. He had so, so much more for Jesus that was coming. It's a life of temptation. Haven't you, Christian, haven't you been down the same road? Tell me, don't you know this? Haven't you traveled this path? I mean, you go through such temptations and you think there's no way out. And God, by His grace and faithful love, He brings you through the temptation. He brings you through the trial. And He picks you up on your feet. And He dusts you off. And you're ready to press on again. And then what do you see when you lift your eyes? There is a line queuing up for you of temptations just waiting to greet you. Just waiting. Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Hebrews 4.15 again Jesus, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Tempted as us, but he did not sin. He felt the full force of temptation. You know, we often don't feel the full force of temptation. Why? We don't feel the full magnitude of it because we so often give in to it. And we get a bit of reprieve. We give in. Jesus continually resisted, resisted, and it mounted and mounted and mounted, and he never got a break. Because he never yielded. Never yielded. So we must remember Jesus became one of us. He was not spared from the fiercest temptations. And yet he was without sin. Friends, hallelujah. What a savior we have. So he was made like us. He's a brother who was tempted like us. Thirdly this morning, he's a brother who also suffered. Look again at verse 18. For he himself has suffered when tempted. See, he didn't just become flesh to die. He didn't just become flesh so that he could endure temptation. He became flesh that he could also suffer. Suffer with us. Isaiah, again, Isaiah 53 prophesied of Jesus. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus knew grief. See, often when we think of Jesus suffering, okay, Jesus suffered, where do our minds immediately go to? Okay, we go to his trial, we go to the floggings, we go to the crown, and then we go to the cross. But we have to understand, Jesus' sufferings, they began long before Calvary, long before his trial. Think about it. We feel grief sometimes when we are surrounded by unbelievers and we watch their behavior you know, when you're around a non-Christian and you listen to them just blaspheme God's name one time after another and you just want to shut your ears, it hurts. And you listen to the coarse language that comes out of their mouth and they talk about the way that they live, the immorality and the ungodliness that they love and, and it cuts you to the heart. We grieve over that and we are sinners ourselves. Imagine Jesus, perfectly holy, sinless and righteous. And he lived every day of his life among such people, hearing the blasphemies, hearing the filth, seeing the wickedness. It was all against him. Even if they didn't realize it, they were sinning against him. He's God. He walked this great land of sin. He was amongst it and it grieved him. And he also suffered the greatest pains that can befall a person. What is that? The death of a loved one. He experienced the grief and suffering of a death of a loved one. When his great friend died, Jesus is told the news and it says he weeps. Hold on a second. Jesus is going to raise him in a few days. He hears the news. His friend has died and he weeps. He knew a broken heart. He knew the sting of death. Does he not know grief like us? He also suffered being slandered. Jesus was no stranger to having his name dragged through the mud. When you look at his ministry, he offered so much love and kindness to the worst of sinners, 
the prostitutes and tax collectors, the worst. And he never participated in their sin. He never condoned it, but he kept reaching out, offering them eternal life. And yet, what did his enemies say? What did they say of Jesus when he went to them? Matthew eleven nineteen. Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of sinners. Defamation is a buzzword today. Jesus knew defamation. His name tarnished. They sought to spoil his spotless character. He was perfect and they tried to tarnish it. Friends, Jesus knows what it is to suffer slander. He knows false accusations. He knows when your name is dragged through the mud. He's been there. He has. He suffered desertion from his friends too. At his trial, they all deserted him. At the cross, they deserted him. Peter denies him three times publicly. Publicly. He suffered betrayal, not from a random, not from an acquaintance, but from one that he broke bread with, one that he ate with and he traveled with day in and day out, one that he poured time into. He suffered. How much did Judas's kiss sting that cheek? More than, more than the slaps, more than the punches of the guards. The kiss of a friend, betrayal. He suffered great mental and psychological agony. I mean, you try and grasp what we read in the Garden of Gethsemane. How do you grasp it? It says he walked in, he stopped, and he fell to the ground. And he fell on his face. This is Jesus who was walking on the raging sea. And now he's on solid ground. And he falls to his face. And then what does it say? He began to sweat great drops like blood. This is him who could sleep through the storm while everyone's panicking of death. And he's so calm and asleep. And now he's sweating in great anguish and he's crying out, Father, if there is any other way, take this cup from me. Why is, what is he so dreading? That he would... He would come to such grief. What's he dreading? This leads us to the pinnacle, the crescendo of all of his sufferings. What's that? Well, you say it's when they took him and they grabbed the nine tails, which had bits of metal and bits of bone on it, and they lashed his back with it, tearing his body apart. Yeah, that was suffering. You say it was when they jammed the crown of twisted thorns upon his skull. That was suffering. Or you say, no, no, it's when they took those soft, tender hands and feet and they grabbed nail spikes and a mallet and drove those spikes through his feet into the wood. And it's when they raised him up and he was suspended in the air, trying to hold himself up just so that he could gain a breath each second. It's all horrendous and it's all unfathomable, but that was not the pinnacle of his suffering. That is not what he was dreading most in the garden when he said, Father, if there's any other way. What was he dreading? He was dreading the judgment and the holy wrath of his Father. We read that last week. What does it say in verse 17? He came to make propitiation for the sins of the people. What's that word propitiation? To appease the wrath, to satisfy, absorb the wrath of God. He suffered under his father. He was bearing our guilt. Therefore, he had to bear the punishment for us. He had to suffer. He had to suffer God's burning anger towards our sin. Isaiah 53 again prophesies, verse 10, Yet it was the will of Yahweh to crush him. He has put him to grief. Because he was bearing our guilt and our sin. That's why when he's on the cross at midday, what does God do at 12 o'clock? He turns off the lights. On the light of the world, he turns off the lights. Christ became a curse for us to redeem us from the curse. And it's darkness. And he's bearing the judgment of God. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? The Father's turning his face away. See, on the cross, Christ is experiencing the hell that every unbeliever will endure for all eternity. In those few hours, he experiences the full measure of it in our place. From his Father. For us, see, he was not spared so that we could be. And he knew it was coming. See, Jesus knew suffering 
See, the problem is when we suffer really, really, really badly and we're in such a, in such a terrible place, we can start thinking, God doesn't really know what I'm going through. What's the answer? We don't really know what he suffered. We don't understand. He understands what we're going through. We don't understand what he suffered. Let me quote Kruger. He writes, He experienced the very worst of what you and I experienced, plus things we now don't have to. Nobody ever looked at Jesus' life and said, I wish I had a life like that. He had a brutally hard existence. This is critical to why he's such an effective high priest, because he can relate to you and me. End quote. Well, this leads us just really quickly to our last point. We've seen him made like us. He was tempted. He, was, he suffered. And lastly, he is the brother who can help us. Look again at verse 18. I'll try and be quick here. Verse 18. But because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This whole passage has many different titles for Christians. Just this whole passage. Verse 11, we're called Jesus' brothers. Verse 16, we're called the offspring of Abraham. What's the title given to Christians in verse 18? Verse 18, those being tempted. Now that's smooth English translation. Literally the Greek reads, he's able to help the tempted ones. How's that for a fitting title for us? The tempted ones. Satan is the tempter. And who does he come after the hardest? God's people. And the author says, we are the tempted ones. What a fitting title. It's a lamentable title. If it were not what it says, for what it says in verse 18, he is able to help the tempted. When it says help there, it means he is able to come to the aid of. Where do we see that so illustrated in the New Testament? Peter decides he's going to walk on water. And he steps out in faith towards Jesus. But when he sees the waves, he starts doubting Christ and he begins to sink. And Peter cries out, Lord, save me. What's the next verse say? And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. Immediately. He is able to come to the aid of his people. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand like a mother to an endangered child, like a husband who sees his wife being threatened. He is able to come and help those who are being tempted. He's able. This is what we need. Don't we need someone to help us in our temptation? We need a Savior to deliver us from our sins eternally. But we need someone also in the here and now who can help us with our day-to-day -day temptations. Where was Jesus most sharply tempted? In the wilderness. Where do you and I live? We're on the way to heaven, but we're not there. We live in the wilderness. We're living in Babylon. They call evil good and good evil. Right is wrong to them. This is where we are dwelling and temptations are at every turn. Every single turn calling out to us. That's why the scripture says we are in a battle. We are in a battle because we're not yet in heaven. We're called to fight the good fight. We're in a race. We're called to run. There's no looking back. There's no turning back. Don't we need help if we're in a battle and we're in a race? And what perfect help we have in Jesus. Friends, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He's the son of God. He's the high and lifted up one. But we must never forget, the author says, he is the God who is near. And he is the God who has been there. He's been there and he understands. That's why it says, because he suffered being tempted, he is able to help the tempted. He's not far removed. He's not unapathetic. What does it say? We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us. He understands our weaknesses. Friends, he walked the same earth as us. He's felt the soil between his toes. He knows what it is like to be here. And he's been there. How can he help us? That's what the text says. He can help us. How can he do it? Well, we get two ways in verse 17. Look what it says. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. There's two things we get from Jesus. Mercy and faithfulness. 
mercy and faith. See, he's merciful. He's not ready to pounce on us when we fail. We need to remember that. He's not there waiting with a stick. He's not a cruel master when we stuff up. He's been in our shoes. He's been there and he understands. He sympathizes and he's ready to show pity. There's so much tenderness in his heart and he's more willing to help than we are willing to ask for it. He is merciful. He's merciful. And that's why we're urged in two chapters down. He says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. He's merciful because he's been here and he understands and he's ready to show mercy. He'll give you strength for every temptation and he'll bring comfort for every sorrow. He's there. He's there. And it says he's faithful He has bound himself to us, church, in everlasting covenant. He has bound himself to us. He's always available. He's not up and down. He's not hot and cold. He doesn't fall in and out of love with us. He doesn't. And he's not unreliable. He never takes leave. He never clocks off. And his door's never closed. At home, if I'm working from home, times where I can leave the door open and the kids can come in or they can come in and out freely. And they can come in for a cuddle. They can tell me what they've shown, what they've drawn, any of that stuff. But there are other times when they know that they cannot come in when the door's closed. Brooke knows, the kids know, there are times when we can't. Jesus is not like that. He's always available. He's not kind on Sunday and cruel on Wednesday. Let me, co- let me close The author is trying to tell us in our trials, in our temptations, don't run to the phone looking for help. First, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. If you get anything from this, in the thick of it, run to Jesus. I'll close with a story. In the 19th and 20th century, century, there was a preacher named Booth Tucker. And during this period, he was conducting some evangelistic meetings in a large hall in Chicago. One night after he'd preached to the masses on the sympathy of Jesus, a man came forward and asked Booth Tucker how he could talk about a loving, understanding, sympathetic God. If your wife had just died like mine has, said the man, and your babies were crying for their mother who would never come back, you wouldn't be saying what you're saying. A few days later, Booth Tucker's wife was tragically killed in a train crash. Her body was brought to Chicago for her funeral and carried to the very same hall used where Booth ran his evangelistic meetings. After the service, the bereaved preacher looked down into the silent face of his deceased wife in the casket, and then he turned to those who were attending. He then said to the people, The other day I was here. A man told me, if my wife had just died and my children were crying for their mother, I would not be able to say that Christ was understanding or sympathetic or that he was sufficient for every need. If that man is here again today, I want to tell him that Christ is sufficient. My heart is broken. It is crushed, but it has a song and Christ put it there. I want to tell that man that Jesus Christ speaks comfort to me today. The man was there and he came and knelt beside the casket while Booth Tucker introduced him to Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus knows and he is able to help. Will you run to him? Will you run to him? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage. We thank you, Lord, for just another glimpse, another insight that we get into our Lord Jesus Christ. Eternity is not going to be long enough to search out the depths of his greatness and his glory. How high, how deep, how wide, how long is this love that we have received from our God? Lord, I pray for all of us, myself included, that these truths of Christ would be kept within our hearts and minds 
so that when we are faced with temptations and find ourselves suffering, we may find Jesus being the first one we think of. And may we each run to him. And Lord, as you promised, may you help us in our time of need. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.